Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Mr. Ainsworth, and we're going to get into some more real-life applications to sine and cosine, part two. All right, so go into Canvas. Go ahead and uh, upload this into OneNote before we get started, so press play if you need to. Get all set up, and here we go. Here's a little warm-up here. This is nothing new, but I wanted to go over some basics, which are important to get ready for your test here coming up. I'm going to graph the parent function sine x on the domain from negative pi to 3 pi. All right, so we want to graph more than one period here. Afterwards, write the function in terms of cosine two different ways using transformations, using a shift. All right, so let's do this. Okay, now, as you guys know, sine starts at the origin here. And then a pi, sine of pi halves is 1. Sine of pi is 0. Sine of 3 halves pi is negative 1. Sine of 2 pi is 0. And then you just repeat the values. Okay, I'm going to go to the left of 0 now. So I'm going to go sine of negative pi halves is negative 1, and then the sine of negative pi is back at 0. And then you curve it. All right, so let's see, see if I can do a good job here. So we curve the function, okay? So it goes from a min up to a max, down to the wave axis, which happens to be the x-axis now, down to a minimum, back to the wave axis, to a max. Okay, so there is from negative pi uh, to 3 pi. And that's what I meant up here on the domain. All right, that tells you where to start and finish your function. So just understand that. Okay, now we want to write it in terms of cosine right here. In terms of cosine, two different ways. All right, so here we go, using shifts. Okay, first way, probably the easiest way, is to start at a max. Now, typically, a cosine function starts at 1. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw the cosine parent, cosine of x. I'm going to do a quick sketch of that so you can see it. Oops, hang on. Let me fix that. I'm going to do this in red. Okay, so here's one period. I'll do a little bit more than one period. Here's cosine. Okay, so let's draw this. This will help you visualize better. Okay, so there's this in function in red here, this is cosine of x, because notice that we start at one. So the question is, you guys, is how do you get from this max, the original max of the parent, right here to the new max? What do you have to do? Well, all you have to do is just shift it right pi halves, okay? So shift, <clears throat> shift right pi halves, and that's all you have to do, and you get the same function, but written in cosine. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So my first method here is, is to shift uh, right pi halves. If we do that, that's easy. All we have to do is subtract pi halves from x, and now we have a new function in terms of cosine. y is equal to cosine, same amplitude of 1, but this time we're going to subtract pi halves, which will be a right shift, okay? A right shift, and we can check that. We'll check that. In fact, let's just check that right now just to make sure we're on the right track. So check with decimals, right? We do this in class all the time. So let's do it here. So here's the, let me turn off my previous functions and change the scale. I'm going to have to change the axes here. So negative pi to 3 pi. So notice I clicked on the wrench, changed my domain, and changed the step to pi half. So pi divided by 2. If we need to change this later, we will. And so notice right here, there's your sine function. Okay. And then uh, and then you have to type the other one in. So the other one is the second one right here. Notice that if I click on it, okay, it gets the same graph. All right. You, you only see one graph up here because they are overlapping. They're the same functions. Okay. Now, how else can we do it? Well, we don't have to shift it right pi halves. What I could do, and let's just switch colors here, what I could do is shift it to the left here, pi halves. So maybe shift left, shift left, uh, pi halves. All right, but notice there's the graph doesn't exist there, right? Okay, so no problem. Go ahead and reflect it. Okay, so shift. So my sh the second one here is to shift left, all right, pi halves, okay, by adding. Okay, and then reflect it using a negative. Now, I'm not saying that these are the only ones available here. You can do, you can get to any, uh, you can use any shift you want. There's like an infinite number of answers here. 
All right, but these are two easy ones to work with here. So on this one here, I need to reflect it. So I'm going to start off with a negative cosine, but I want to shift left. So I'm going to add pi halves to my angle here, and that would that would make it shift left as opposed to subtracting would be a shift right. So at this point, uh, let's go ahead and let's take a look. Okay, let's go ahead and type that function in here. And the other one, here we go, it's already loaded up. And notice that if you click on all three of them, you only see one graph. And the reason why is because they all overlap, my friends. Okay, they all overlap. All right, and that's how you, sh uh, you do that. So let's go ahead and uh, let's bring this in to our OneNote, okay? Just so that you have a good record of it here. That's good enough. Just copy and delete. If you guys are working on iPads, we do this all the time in class right here and let's just bring it off to the side click on text mode and then press and hold and there you go all right and there is how you check it using desmos okay that was kind of nice to know you're right okay there's a two of many possibilities here to rewrite the function in terms of cosine two different ways using shifts or transformations all right now let's take a look at a real problem in context here all right and this is what we we want to spend our time on today and so in this one here Shelly observes moon outside her window each night her percentage of the moon she can see can be modeled by the sinusoidal function a sine function okay you gotta love that word right there so sinusoidal function which is your sine function given by uh, below where p is the per percent okay so p is percent of the moon that is visible and t is the day so t represents the day and here, uh, you have to be careful. We start observing on June 7th. And so this part's important here. It says on June 7th, that's where we, we start clocking it. And so that represents t equal zero. All right. T equal one would be on June 8th. T equal two would be on June 9th, etc. All right. So that's our starting, our start. Okay. So let's interpret here. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and write the general form right above it here. So y is equal to a sine of b bx. Actually, let me write it in full general form here. So b times x minus h plus k right here. And there's nothing being subtracted from t, so h is 0. So there's only a vertical shift here of 50. Okay, so that's an upshift of 50. We got, a, we got an amplitude of 50, and b is 2 pi over 28 in that case. Okay. All right, so let's, uh, let's figure this out. Okay, so what is the period? Well, we know that the period in general is 2 pi divided by whatever b is. In this case, b is 2 pi over 28. So 2 pi divided by 2 pi 28 multiplied by the reciprocal. I get 2 pi times 28 over 2 pi. And notice right there, okay, obviously the 2 pi's cancel out. All right, and the period is 28. And it says interpret this in the value in... Uh, context and so what do you think 28 represents in this case and we're talking about you know a period of time during a month right here and so we're talking about a monthly cycle of 28 days okay so a monthly cycle or you can say period right so monthly cycle or period okay of 28 days which sounds reasonable because I know day, the days in the month range from 28 to 31, I get that. But in this function here, the monthly cycle is 28 days. All right, it says, what, is, what percentage of the moon will Shelley be able to see on June 10th? Okay, so let's, let's understand this. So at T, on June, June 7th here, June 7th, that's T equals zero. Then on June 10th, well, that'd be three days later, so T would be three. So what we want to do is find p of 3 or simply substitute 3 into a function and figure out the percent, percentage of the moon that she'll likely see. As it says right here, percentage of the moon, that's p. That's p of 3 right there. All right, so here we go. So let's, let's go for it. So we have 50 times the sine of 2 pi over 28, all right, times 3, all right, plus 50 more. All right, and you want to approximate this. So obviously we go, you need uh, either T84 or Desmos. I'm just using this right here just because, well, guess what? It's uh, readily available for me. 
Okay, we use Desmos in class all the time. I know you guys are using the T84 a lot. You can do that uh, for sure. So one way to do it is to type the function in and and actually, let me, let me do something here. Oops, oops, oops. <clears throat> let me just evaluate the function here. So let me put three in. So times three. So take out the X and go ahead and multiply by three right there and simplify, okay, or round actually. So 81.174, all right, percent. So let's bring that over here. So 81 point, what I say, 174, I think, percent of the moon she will see on July or June 10th, okay? So on June 10th. Okay, on which day will she likely adver um, observe the full moon? Well, if you go back to the problem here, okay, um, a full moon, that's probably 100%. Full meaning 100%. So full moon, you can interpret that as a 100% likelihood. Okay, 100% max. So you're going to be looking at a max right there. Okay, so basically if you wanted to solve this equation, you could put 100 in for... P of T, okay, because it's 100%, full moon, okay. So when is this function 50 sine of 2 pi, uh, 2 pi over 28T uh, plus 50, when is that equal to 100? Well, let's go to decimals one more time. And we're going to be looking at a maximum, okay. What is the maximum on this function, which occurs, you know, when the percentage is 100%. So let's go back here. I'm gonna write it as a function again. So I'm gonna go back and write this as a function. Okay, there we go. And let me, let me say y equals, you know, in Desmos here, you instead of using P and T, you know, Desmos likes Y's and X's here. So go ahead and, and put this in. I'm gonna change my scale back to something more reasonable here. So zero to, something uh, bigger here and something more appropriate and then take out my step and just do a step of one let's see what happens let's see if this is good okay so i have to adjust this i'm adjusting here and you want to take a look at a max okay and you can also type in y equals 100 and it occurs right here at max and when does that occur it occurs when when t is seven okay so after seven days okay all right so this occurs Okay, at t equals seven days. <clears throat> so seven days after the starting point. So seven plus seven, we're talking about 14. So we're talking about June 14th. Okay, so you'll see, she'll see the full moon uh, on June 14th. Now, last one here, on which day does Shelley observe the first new moon? And when they say new moon, that refers to the day when the moon is not visible. Okay, not visible. So you can interpret that right there as 0%. So you got to figure out, and that obviously occurs at a minimum value. Okay, so when does that occur? So let's go back to Desmos here, and let's take a look at a min value. So when does that occur? So down here at the minimum here at t equals 21. So 21 days after June 7th. So here, let's say at t equals 21 days, okay? After, it says June 7th there in the directions. All right, so 21 plus seven is 28. Okay, so we're talking about June 28th. Okay, we're talking about that for the new moon. Okay, so that meaning that you can barely see it. Okay, it's not visible. All right, and there is a real context problem. You know, they give you the function and interpret the values, and you will see something like this on your exam. Okay, because in AP Precalc, we always have a context in, uh, you know, in our problem solving. And we went over all the basics first, and now we are problem solving. So there you go. Okay, now here's a really cool one. This is a famous Ferris wheel problem right here. And so we're going to read it just slightly here first. And so we can, you know, get an idea of what's going on. And then I will uh, show you a little animation here using Desmos. So this is kind of cool. 
Suppose we were given the following problem uh, involving a Ferris wheels. Okay, you see these at carnivals. The height of a certain carriage, and this right here, these are called, these are carriages right here. This is, you know, the, 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 the thing that you jump into before you go oscillate around this Ferris wheel here. So you go into the carriage, they lock you in, and then you go around and around and around, okay? Because you love the, you know, the time when you guys go to uh, the fairs, or maybe you might have done this at Magic Mountain or Knott's Berry Farm or something. Okay, but I know fairs happen. This is like one of the famous all-time uh, rides at fairs. So the height of a certain carriage, okay, again, the carriage is that thing you jump into on a Ferris wheel, as it rotates, can be modeled by the cosine function. Okay, look at this. The height of a certain carriage, as it rotates, can be modeled by using a cosine function. So we're going we're gonna to do that here together today. I'm going to show you why, and then we're going to obviously do that together. So what are the facts? This Ferris wheel has a wheel diameter of 120 meters. It is quite big. Okay, so let's just write down some of the facts. So it has a 120 meter diameter. In fact, let's just go ahead and annotate our, our Ferris wheel as we, as we start talking about it here. Let's do that. Okay, so from top to bottom. So going to this Ferris wheel here, it has a diameter okay of 120 meters so from top to bottom right here this distance right here you can look at it horizontally or you can look at uh, this vertically it really doesn't matter the diameter can be seen horizontally or vertically the diameter is 120 meters okay and it contains several carriages as you can see in the picture here and gets off 24 minutes after having gone around eight times okay this talks about the speed of the, the Ferris wheel and also gives you information on one how long it takes to make one complete revolution, which in this case is going to refer to the period. Okay, When the carriage is at the bottom of the wheel, it is one meter off the ground. So obviously it can't hit the ground right here, otherwise we'd have a very serious problem. So this distance right here is one meter. And this is where you enter the Ferris wheel right here. There's a little person right here. Okay, that's a little person right there. So you enter the Ferris wheel at the bottom, if you remember at the fair, and then you go around and around, okay? It rotates, okay? It rotates. So let's, uh, let's that's the idea right here, and then we're going to answer all these questions here. All right, but before we do, you kind of need to know why does it, or why can it be modeled by a cosine function? Okay, so we're going to just detract or sidetrack just for a momento here and take a look at why that's the case. Okay, so give me a second here. I had this all loaded up. Let's see, where'd it go? Ferris wheel problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, give me a second here, guys. Okay. <laughs> Give me a second. I can't pause the video right at this moment. And I've got the wrong hyperlink. Um, so give me a second here. Let me just bring in another document. Aha, uh -huh. there we go. Oh, that's why. Okay, so now I understand what's going on here, guys. I, I apologize for this right here. I forgot to hit text box here. There we go. There's my hyperlink gone. Okay, so I apologize for that. Let's get rolling here. So check this out. This is a Desmos uh, demonstration here of, of a Ferris wheel. It doesn't have the same dimensions as our Ferris wheel, but it gives you a great idea of what's going on. 
Okay, so in this diagram here, these, these two circles represent your Ferris wheel. Is that a different height? The diameter is different. Like if you read the problem here, it says the radius is five meters. And it's got a different amplitude because it's a different diagram. But what I, what's important here and what you have to understand is why does going around a Ferris wheel in a circular motion, uh, when, you, when you go ahead and graph the height as a function of time, where the vertical y-axis is the height axis and the horizontal axis is your time axis or t-axis here, why does this end up being a cosine function? So watch this, okay? So at the bottom where you see this big dot at the bottom of the Ferris wheel here or at the bottom of the big circle, okay, that's where you enter the ride. And then slowly the Ferris wheel takes off and it goes around and around. And notice that, look at the cosine function here. It starts at a minimum. And then of course, when you reach the top of the Ferris wheel, it hits a max. And then guess what? You got to go back down, right? Because you're on a circle. You're on a circular Ferris wheel. And so it goes back down from maximum all the way down to the minimum. And the period of time that it takes, uh, or the time that it takes to go one full revolution, is the period. So one more time, you start at the bottom here, and if you notice on the cosine wave, that's at a minimum. All right, and then, so we gotta be careful when we start writing the function here, we start at a minimum, and then of course you increase your height because you're rotating around, it's getting higher and higher and higher, uh, but you're maxed out when you hit reach the top of the circle and then you go back down again and then you go back to the minimum. So one full, the time it takes for one full complete revolution is your period. Well, what is that in our case? So let's go back to the problem. Let's figure this stuff out. Okay, so now it says part A, and let's answer some of these questions right here. Uh, what is the maximum and minimum height of Ashton and Jessica's carriage? Okay, so let's do that. So the diameter is 120 meters. Uh, but it's also one meter high, so let me see, 100 plus 21 will give us the max height. Okay, so right here, let me go off to the side here. So the maximum height, which would be right here. Actually, I don't have to draw arrows, so let me make it even more simple here. So the maximum height would be 120 plus one more, so 121 meters. All right, that's pretty straightforward right here. The minimum height, you know, at its lowest point. So this is our minimum right here. And I'm talking about the minimum height above the ground is equal to one meter. Okay, so we're good there. Now what we need to do, so we've got a maximum of 121 meters. We've got a minimum of one meter. That's part B or part A. Part B, what is the period of the of the function, okay? The height of the carriage after T minutes going around after it started moving, starting from the, the bottom rotating in a counterclockwise direction. What is the period, okay? Well, guess what? That, the period is the speed of the function. In this case, it's how fast it's moving around the circle. And so we need to figure out the time it takes one revolution. So we're gonna take this down here, this information. Okay, I know it takes 24 minutes to go around eight times and that's, that's your angular speed. So uh, right there, we've got 24 minutes, all right, per, per eight revolutions. We know that. Let's simplify this, okay? 24 divided by eight is three, so it takes three minutes for one revolution. Okay, guess what? That represents your period and how fast this thing's moving around. So the period is equal to three, okay? So that answers question part B. It says graph the function. We'll do that here in a minute. We're gonna do, we're gonna find the equation first and then graph it. So now I need to figure out, you know, the the amplitude and the midline. So the midline goes through the center. So let's go ahead and uh, highlight the midline here. This goes right through the center of the Ferris wheel. This is your midline. Now the midline is the average between the max and min. So it's the max plus the min, divide that by two. This is called the average. It's the average value, as you guys know. And so that's gonna be 121 plus one, divide that by two. That's 122 divided by two or 61. So the midline is 61 meters above the ground. Okay, and that is your vertical shift. Okay, this is your vertical shift. And we'll talk about that here in the, in the cosine function. 
Okay, so do we have enough information? We need to know the amplitude, okay? How high and low above the midline we go. So let's take, talk about that here. So the distance between the wave axis or the midline and the max is your amplitude. Or you can think of the amplitude from the midline down to your minimum, so either one. So what would that be? Well, it's 121, all right, minus the, the, uh, the, the radius. So what's the radius? Radius would be right here, or it'd be up there. Actually, let me let me redraw this right here. In red, the radius is 60, so let's subtract 60 here. So the amplitude is 121 minus 60, and guess what? That's 61 meters. Okay, so now I know the amplitude. Or excuse me, I didn't say that right. Uh, I didn't say that right. So what happened here? So 121. Max, what am I doing here? So, oh, the midline's 61. So what am I doing? So I have to subtract the midline. I take the max and subtract the midline, and then I get the amplitude here. So, oh, you know what? Here, here let me do this. So, so I made a mis little mistake there. I so apologize. So let's do it this way. The amplitude is max minus min divided by two. So we're gonna take uh, the max uh, minus the min. All right, divide that by two. So this is 121 minus the min. 121 minus the minimum, which is one, and divide that by two. That's 120 divided by two, or 60. So the amplitude, A, is equal to 60 meters. Okay, I don't know why I, I, I don't know, I, was, I don't know what I was thinking, okay, it's been a long day and I'm extremely tired. Okay, no excuses, there we go. So we know the amplitude is 60 meters here, so 60 up, 60 down. We know the midline, we know the period, guess what, we can write the function. So here we go, so let's write the function, y is equal to a times a cosine of b times x minus h, all right, plus k, so put in the shift there. There's no horizontal shift. It's only been shifted up one unit, so h is zero. And k is your vertical shift or the midline. So we know what k is, is 61. h is zero because there's no horizontal shift. Now, you gotta, here's the tricky part here. All right, the amplitude is not positive because we're starting at the minimum. We're not starting at a maximum. So we can't put positive 60 here for an amplitude because then we'd start at the max and not the min. So what do we do? We reflect it, okay? So we're gonna reflect and start at a minimum. So I'm gonna write down negative 60 cosine of, of the period. Let me see. Oh, I got, you know what? I gotta calculate B. I haven't calculated B yet. So let me pause here because I need to calculate B. So if I know the period is three, that tells me that b is equal to 2 pi, 2 pi divided by the period. And so this is 2 pi divided by 3. So now I know my b value. Okay, so I've got 2 pi thirds. So 2 pi thirds times x here, times x. There's no horizontal shift, so h is 0. And then the wave axis is up 61 units, so we got a vertical shift of 61. Okay, and remember, this right here, we need to reflect the, the parent here and start at a minimum. Because you can tell we're starting at the bottom of the Ferris wheel at a minimum and not a maximum. Okay, so that's a key aspect. You know, that's, so stop the video here and contemplate that and make sure you understand what's going on right there because we're not starting at a max. Okay, we're starting at a minimum. Okay, so now we know the function. I guess we can graph it, right? So let's do that right through here and then solve the rest of the problems afterwards. Okay, so what we need to do is we're going to start um, at one on the, on the x-axis here. Excuse me, on the y-axis at one. because our minimum is, you know, so the Ferris wheel right here is one meter up. So let me graph that here. So we're starting one meter up. You gotta approximate that. That's at one meter. 
All right, and then there's a period of three, so we've got to go from here all the way to here. Period is three units, or three, excuse me, three, three minutes right here. And then it's got a max. Let's take a look at what we've got. It's got a max at 121. So max at 121. So I'm going to draw my guiding lines like I usually do here. My minimum is at one meter here. And again, this scale is kind of uh, big here. So I'm going to just sketch where one's is close to. It's very close to the axis here. So it's kind of hard to draw. But just know that this is one unit up. So we start at one meter. So that's your minimum. And your max is at 121. And then, of course, you got your wave axis at 61. So I'm going to approximate 61 or your midline or your wave axis at 61. So just go ahead and, and put your guiding lines in to help you graph the function right through here and then start plotting points. So I'm going to plot here at 0, 1. Uh, and then again, we're, we have to divide this up into four equal parts. Ooh, ooh we got to divide three into four equal parts. Better do that first. So three divided by four is 0.75, as you guys know. So zero comma 0.75, another plus 0.75 would be 1.5. Keep adding 0.75, you get 2.25. And then add another 0.75, you get back to three. So divide the interval into four equal parts. So divide... Uh, period into four equal parts, and now we can get graphing here. So on the wave axis, okay, you're obviously, you obviously know, start there, and then you count roughly 0.75 units, which you're going to have to approximate, and then one and a half, that's a little bit easier, and then uh, well, 2.25, which is a little beyond two, a little bit less than two and a half, so maybe right about here, and then the last ones we end here. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to plot. So in blue, so I start here at the minimum, then I go up to the wave axis, and then I go halfway up and I go to the max, and then back to the wave axis, and then end right here. So here we start, and then here we end. Okay, so, and then we sketch it. So here we go. Let's see if I can do this. Okay, -na 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 -na. it's a curve. Hey, it's not too bad. Hey, that's not too bad. Not perfect, but that's not too bad. All right. Now, uh, we better check that. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's bring in Desmos here. And let's check this function. Okay, so do I have it in here? So no, I do not. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another function and type it in. So we have here y is equal to, and we're going to type in negative 60. All right, cosine. Okay, and we have 2 pi thirds times x, so 2 pi uh, divided by 3. 2 thirds pi times x, and then... We're going to have to add 61, so plus 61. And then you got to use your fingers and change the scale because our period's three. So there we go. So notice that it doesn't hit the, right here, it doesn't hit the, uh, the origin here. It's one unit up. And then, you know, let's draw in the, uh, the, ampl uh, the wave axis or the midline. Let's type in y equals 61 just so you can see it. There we go. So here you're at the bottom, at the start, the minimum, then you hit the max at 1.5, 1.5 uh, comma 121, because remember, that's the max, and then you're back to the midline, and then you're down there at the minimum at 3 comma 1. So this graph right here is just like the one on the left, okay, if you compare the two, <laughs> okay, it's it. Okay, in fact, you know what, that is so good, let's screenshot that baby and, and bring that in. Oh, you know what? I can't do that when I'm recording. Okay, well, we'll bypass that. You guys can do that, though. Okay, so now we have this right here. Now we can answer some of the other questions. So let's get on it. Here we go. Uh, we found the function. We found part D. We found the function, h of t. Oh, we've got to write the function, h of t. So h of t now, your height function is negative 60 
times cosine of pi thir 2 pi thirds times t. So do a variable switch plus 61. So your function h of t should be written correctly. Okay, so you use the correct variables. So instead of the y-axis here, we have the height axis. So this is height, okay, versus time. Okay, all right. Now, the ride suddenly stops five minutes. Look at this, five minutes and 30 seconds after they got on. How high is their carriage above the ground? Okay, so we got to evaluate the function at this time right here. And I don't know about you guys, but it sounds like 5.5 minutes, right? Okay, so let's do that. Let's evaluate the, let's find the height at five and a half minutes. Okay, and we're dealing with fractions here, two thirds pi. So you know what, I'm gonna do a little, I'm gonna convert five and a half to 11 halves. 11 divided by two is five and a half. And I'm gonna substitute in 11 halves because I'm dealing with fractions. So, and I'm gonna try to avoid using the calculator here. So let's see if we can do it. So we got two thirds pi times 11 halves. And then we gotta take the cosine of it and then add 61. Can we do this, all right, without a calculator? Well, let's find out. Now, if we have to use a calculator, we will, but let's see if we can do it without it. So two divided by two is one, so we cancel there. And so we get negative 60 times the cosine of what? Uh, 11 thirds pi. So 11 thirds pi, all right, plus 61. Now 11 thirds pi, hmm. Let's take that off to the side here. So 11 thirds pi, that's equivalent to three and two thirds pi. That's, now you guys know from previously that if you subtract a multiple period, because it's periodic, you get the same value. So I'm gonna subtract two pi, and I get one and two thirds pi. Okay, which is the same as five thirds pi. And guess what, that's on the unit circle. Okay, that's quadrant four angle, guys. Okay, one and two thirds pi is quadrant four with a reference angle of pi thirds. So that's why we, we did all that work in the beginning. So this has a reference angle of pi thirds. So cosine in quadrant four is positive. And all I have to know, you know is what's the cosine of 60 degrees. Okay, so I get 30, 60, 90 triangle here. And the cosine of 60 degrees is one half. So what I do is take negative 60 times one half and then add it to 61. Half of 60 is negative, half of negative 60 is negative 30. And if I add th uh, 61, I get 31 meters, okay? So that would tell you at the height above the ground, you know, when it stops, okay? So after five and a half minutes, so after, this is the height now, okay, above ground, Okay, it's 31 meters after 5.5 minutes of rotating. And that's what h of t, your function, tells you. It gives you the height at any time t, and in this case, it's 31 meters above the ground. All right, so that right there is part E, last one. How long does it take the carriage to reach the height of 91 meters above the ground? Hmm, okay, so let's figure that out. So let's go off to the side. And let's do that. Let's do part F over here. Okay, so the height of 91 meters. So that's an H value. So H equals 91 meters of the ground. So how long does it take? T equals question mark. So you got to find T in this case when the height is 91. So what we're going to do is we're going to use our function. So when is 91 equal to negative cos 60 degrees times cosine of 2 thirds uh, t right here because we're solving for t or x if you will okay plus 61 you could write t or x there, it really doesn't matter but we're solving for t so it might as well just use t right okay um, what do we do what do we do so let's start solving let's see if we can do this without a calculator too so let's subtract 61 so i get 30 is equal to negative 60 times the cosine of 2 pi 2 thirds pi two-thirds pi times t. All right, do a little simple math here. So divide by negative 60. Okay, so nothing new here. Okay, who said trig wasn't easy or wasn't? I didn't say that right. Who said trig was hard? That's what I meant to say. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, so let's continue. So 30 divided by negative 60 is negative one-half. So cosine of two, two pi-thirds, okay, t, gives you negative one half. So what values of t or what angle 
of cosine or cosine of what angle? Because remember, this is this is an angle right here. This is an angle. The cosine of what angle gives you negative one half? Okay, and so it'd be like if you know your unit circle really well, <laughs> which would really come in handy, uh, then this would be an easy question. We need to figure out when, for what angles is cosine equal to negative one half. So let's do this. So if you don't have that unit circle memorized, okay, let's just type it in and let's grab a unit circle real quick here. And I can't screenshot, but here we go. So if you look at quadrant two, the cosine of two thirds pi is negative one half, okay? And then in quadrant three, the cosine of four thirds pi is also negative one half. So we have multiple angles that would work here. We could either pick two thirds pi or four thirds pi as our angles. So let's bring those in. So your angle here, this angle, which is two pi thirds t, could be equal to either one of those angles I just mentioned. So uh, two, it could be it could be equal to two thirds pi, or it could be equal to four thirds pi. And you got to ask yourself, you know, when does this happen? For what value of t? Again, we're trying to find the time, right? Well, if you take a look at this first equation here, two thirds pi times what value? Again, this is a t value. I should write that better. That's t times t. Two thirds times t. Two thirds times what number gives you two thirds pi? Well, the obvious answer is one, okay? Or if you wanna take a look at the other one here, uh, the other equation is two pi thirds, t is equal to four thirds pi. What does t have to be? Well, t could be two, okay? So we're gonna just take a, take a look at the first one. So let's reread the question here. So how long does it take the carriage to reach the first height? Ooh, look at the directions here. It says first height, first reach, the keyword first. So actually, let's let's underline that in red. How long does it take the carriage to reach to first reach? Okay, the height of ninety-one meters. Because remember, it goes up, and then it has to come back down. So it happens twice, right? And so our answers, uh, we have two answers right here. We have t equals one. We have t equals two. And we're this is the first one here. So here, uh, it's going to happen after one minute. So at t equal one minute, okay? Or then the second time, when it comes back down, so it's after two minutes on the way back down. Because remember, there's a Ferris wheel, right? So it goes up and down. <laughs> That's why it hasn't been in a maximum, guys. And it's periodic, because it goes around and around and around and things repeat. So the Ferris wheel problem here in this, in this discussion here is probably one of the most famous applications to trigonometric functions and especially the cosine function. You will also see people, if you go online, they talk about this uh, and how to convert it into uh, sine as well. You can do that, no problem. Like I said, every sine function can be written as a cosine function and vice versa, so you can do that. Okay, the rest is review, so you guys finish the rest. All right, so this is homework here for you guys. All right, so this is on your own. And because of that, you gotta check for quality. So check uh, with instructor's notes. Okay, instructor's notes, excuse me. In Canvas, where I post everything, my videos and everything else. Okay, so do that, finish it. Shouldn't take you very long at all. It's review. And then I will see you, all right? in my next lesson. So this is Mr. Ainsworth here. Hopefully that helped you out. Take care. Bye-bye.